name is Stephen Whiteman, and I'm reader in the Art and Architecture of China here at the Courtauld. And today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a great new acquisition in the library, the Qinggong Chenshi Dang'an. What is the Qinggong Chenshi Dang'an? It is the archive of palace furnishings in the palaces of the Qing Dynasty, which ruled over China from the mid-17th to the end of the 19th or early 20th century. This archive uh, has just come to the Courtauld from uh, mainland China. It consists of 45 volumes, of which we have only here a small sampling, um, and we are the only library in the United Kingdom to hold this important new publication. The archive records objects by their rooms, but not only in terms of where they were displayed, but also when they were acquired, sometimes when they were gifted to people outside the court, and also when they were disposed of by the court. And so in that sense, it is not only a record of furnishings, the, the way in which objects were distributed around palaces or set up and displayed in palaces, but also a record of the objects themselves, a sort of collection, or an archive of the many, many different types of objects that were held in the imperial collection. So I mentioned that the archive is organized by palace, but that there are also 800 palaces in the Forbidden City uh, and many more beyond the Forbidden City's confines. And so there has to be some further organization within that. The way it works is that it starts in what's called the outer court, or what the court's public areas are, where the emperor would see visitors, um, where he would hold public court, where he'd have audiences with officials. These are the great throne rooms and the great halls of state ritual that exist primarily in the Forbidden City. It then moves to so-called inner court, or the area of private residence for the emperor and his household. Within the inner court, it moves uh, down its sort of central line of the palace's organizations, and then the eastern portion of the palace, and then the western portion of the palace. Then further, within each of those sections, it is organized by compound or palace or temple, which is to say that within what we think of as the Forbidden City or the palace, there are many small palaces, places, groups of halls that had the word palace attached to them as part of their name and served various functions as residences or as areas for work or areas for leisure or recreation for various of the residents of the inner court. The most important of those, for instance, is the Yang Xin Dian, or the palace for cultivating the heart mind, which is the place where the emperor lived. And this comprises a significant uh, portion of the overall 44 volumes. So in this sense, we can also think of the archive not only as a list of objects organized by place, but is also sort of a map of the palace itself. It thinks spatially about the way the objects are distributed and organizes those in a logical fashion that allow us to move through the spaces of the emperor's outer and inner worlds. Now, within 44 volumes, you might think that it would be pretty hard to find what you wanted if it were only organized in that one way. If your research, for instance, focuses on the Yang Xinjian, no problem. You go to the volumes that focus on the Yang Xinjian. But what if your research focuses on jades, or on things from the 1760s, or something like this? Well, the set is very conveniently and very helpfully indexed in actually the smallest of the volumes, the index, but perhaps the most powerful and valuable of them. There, we see things uh, reorganized or cross-indexed by the type of hall, and so we can access groups of temples or groups of throne rooms or groups of libraries, for instance by the type of objects, including paintings and calligraphy, jades, seals, uh, clocks, things like this, uh, by date. And so if you're really particularly interested in the 1760s or the 1820s, you can access that particular period quite easily. Uh, and then also by a series of different, essentially alphabetical systems. One is genuinely alphabetical, and then the other is by stroke count, or the number of strokes in the character that uh, starts the thing that you're looking for. For those of you who aren't um, scholars of China already, this is a very common way for dictionaries and other indexes to be organized in China.
So what sort of things can we learn from this giant archive about the Qing court? Well, so the first issue, of course, is furnishings, essentially the interior decoration of the court. This is not just a matter of understanding where various objects are deployed, of course, but also understanding the sort of stage managing of emperorship, the stage, the visual and material culture of authority in the 18th and 19th century. We don't often think of the emperor, or at least current scholarship is not often thought of the emperor as situated within architectural spaces. But those architectural spaces were not only very important to the day-to-day -day rule of the Qing court, but also the way objects were deployed to signal power, to signal certain types of ideals, was very important to the construction of a sort of visual and material experience of authority um, within the court. We can also learn a lot about the deployment and use of individual objects. So for instance, earlier I mentioned seals. You're probably very familiar with the idea that on paintings and documents in China, there are often these red marks. These are called seals. And often they signal the, uh, the sort of signature of the artist or the signature of a collector. And indeed in the court, that's very much what they do. They indicate imperial ownership. But they indicate a lot more than that. They, are, they really are substitutes for what we think of as a signature now. Um, they held, held legal authority uh, and imperial authority, and possessing the seals of state, so-called, was a big part of, of practicing imperial authority on a day-to-day -day basis. So understanding where these seals were kept, where they were used, means that we now understand better which parts of imperial practice, the actual exercise of day-to-day -day authority, occurred in different spaces. So another really important thing that we can learn about through this archive is the distinction between the inner and outer courts. I mentioned earlier that the outer court is where the emperor held court, where he saw officials, where he handled state business, where he performed important state rituals. These are all the types of things that we normally think about when we think about being a king or being an emperor or an empress. Um, the ways in which uh, emperorship, rule, and authority are performed or displayed for people to see. But what we actually see in this archive is that a huge portion of the palace furnishings, which it records, are held within the inner court, um, the emperor's private residence for himself and his, his concubines and his empresses, um, and for very, very few, if any, other people. So how does this change, for instance, my research? I'm substantially a historian of painting and print culture in the, inner, in the Qing palaces. I often get asked uh, where the paintings that I talk about would have been displayed, who would have seen them, what type of effect they would have had. Well, what this archive forces us to confront is that actually a great portion of the painting produced for the emperor was seen largely only by the emperor, or at least the emperor was really its primary audience. It was rarely seen by anybody else. So this forces us to reconsider the way in which authority was visually constructed and conveyed uh, within the Qing court. Finally, we have so far done relatively little research on, uh, on the lives of women in the palace. Recent scholars who have focused on this uh, important subject have focused substantially on the late 19th century when the archives associated with the Empress Dara Tsushi give us great insight into her life, her authority, and those of the women around her. But this archive uniquely gives us an opportunity to look inside the palaces of women during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And this gives us a really exciting opportunity to think of women not just as attendants or as people in the background of, of paintings of the emperor, but instead as women, as people who exercised their own authority and had their own lives uh, within the court.